Good morning and welcome back to Journal Club. Today we'll be discussing the issue of prosthesis patient mismatch following TAVI, particularly focusing on those with small annually. Today's presenter is Rosella Ruggiero, interventional fellow from Maria Cecilia Hospital, and will be joined by Damiano Ragazzoli as our expert from Humanitas University in Milano. Enjoy the discussion and we look forward to your participation predictors and clinical impact of prosthesis patient mismatch after self-expandable TAVR in small annually. So first of all, let's start with some definition because prosthesis patient mismatch for me at the beginning was a difficult concept to understand. So um, it, is, it is defined as an effective orifice area of a normal functioning prosthesis, which is too small in relation to patient's body, resulting in an abnormal high postoperative gradients. As you can see, uh, transprosthesis uh, trans gradient is a is related to the transprostasis flow, which is inversely related to the effective orifice area. But the flow through the valve is associated, is related to the cardiac output, which is related to the BSA. So to better understand this compact, let me show you in one minute an example. In this slide, you can see um, this table, which is uh, the table which describes the effective orifice area index predicted um, related in relationship to the BSA. On the top, you can see the valve size, the effective orifice area of that valve. On the left side, a BSA of a, a specific patient. As you can see, the effective orifice area of the valve when the BSA of the patient is one is the same as the, the one predicted, for, uh, described from the manufacturers. But when the BSA starts increasing, the, um, uh, the, the, the effective orifice area index became lower and lower. And when the BSA is very high, um, very high a small valve could become the effective orifice area could become uh, critical, acting like the valve is stenotic, even if it's perfectly normal. And this is related to the fact that that specific area is not able to guarantee an adequate uh, cardiac output. Um, at the beginning, this phenomenon was observed in prosthetic surgical valves, and it was related to the fact that the um, valve annually, um, each of, the, of this valve, the, the annually of implantation is very thick. Therefore, the external diameter of the valve is much higher than the internal diameter of the valve, um, deriving an error which is, um, which is smaller than uh, the valve itself. But why is it important as concept? Uh, the patient prosthesis mismatch um, was uh, um, associated with an increased risk of all cause mortality. This is, uh, um, uh, these are uh, results from a meta analysis from 2012. Uh, which involved a lot of uh, paper about the, uh, on, this arg um, on this topic. And as you can see, any type of patient prosthesis mismatch is associated with an uh, increased risk uh, of uh, all cause mortality, as, uh, as well as severe patient prosthesis, uh, particularly in patients with severe patient prosthesis mismatch. The same phenomenon was observed also in TAVR. This is a paper which is published in which was published in 2018 in uh, in Jack intervention in Jack, and um, as you can see, uh, they evaluated the patient at 62,000 patient who underwent TAVR, and uh, in they uh, find out a rate of patient prosthesis mismatch of about. Um, severe patient prosthesis mismatch of about 12%. Um, and as you can see, patients with severe patient prosthesis mismatch um, were at higher risk of uh, mortality. They also um, try to find out the predictors of severe patient prosthesis mismatch, and they uh, find out that valve in valve procedure and valve size below 23 millimeters were associated with an, an were um, strict, um, strongly related to the occurrence of severe PPM. 
uh, with, uh, with this background, uh, now we can start to discuss our paper. The aim of this paper is uh, uh, where, where to? The primary point uh, where, was to identify independent predictors of PPM in patients with the small annuli who underwent self-expandable uh, TABR. The second point uh, was the occurrence, the incident of one year or cause mortality, ischemic stroke or transient uh, ischemic attack, and identify, to identify independent predictors of one year or cause mortality. Patient enrolled in, the, uh, in, this, uh, um, in this study uh, were patient um, previously enrolled in the Tavi Small, um, in Tavi Small Registry, which is a retrospective uh, observational uh, retrospective registry, um, take place from to 2011 and 2018. Uh, you can see in this slide the inclusion criteria. All patients had a um, severe aortic stenosis uh, in native valves. With, uh, defined, with a small annuli defined as an annular area less than 400 millimeters square or an annular perimeter less than 72 millimeters, which underwent uh, transcatheter implantation of um, um, self expandable valve, both supraannular and uh, intraannular. Sorry. Okay. Overall, uh, um, uh, more or less 900 patients were enrolled in the TAVI small registry, but only 445 patients matched the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And they were divided, considering the post-procedural evaluation, in no post-procedural PPM, uh, PPM, defined as an error um, above uh, 0 0.85, and post-procedural post PPM, defined as an error less than 0 0.85. Uh, in this, this group was um, again divided in uh, two groups, um, in moderate PPM, patients with moderate PPM and severe PPM, PPM according to the error. So these are the characteristics of the population. As expected, the majority of the patients were female, and uh, in patients who developed the PPM, uh, the body surface area and the body mass X index were, um, were much higher, as expected. In these slides, you can see the echocardiographic data, which are more or less the same at the baseline, which are more or less the same uh, in, the, in, the, in the two groups. And uh, as, uh, as the um, echocardiographic uh, CT scan data at baseline. So, um, the, ab what about the procedural characteristics? So, as you can see, patient with the patient prothesis mismatch uh, um, post procedural underwent uh, implantation of uh, a valve which is smaller than uh, underwent. Uh, uh, implantation of a um, small uh, size valve, um, which the, uh, compared to patient with the no patient prothesis mismatch uh, after the procedure. And these differences was uh, statistically significant. Um, by contrast, the oversizing by perimeter of the valve um, uh, is a, were associated with a less rate of post-procedural PPM than um, the, the, the normal size of perimeter of the valve. And the same was for the post-dilatation. Patient with, who underwent post-dilatation during the, uh, the procedure had a less rate of post-procedural PPM. And these differences was statistically significant. Now we arrived at the results. At one year follow-up, um, no differences in terms of events were observed between patients with PPM and no PPM. However, the authors, uh, the, uh, this uh, was related to one year uh, medium uh, follow-up. However, the, the authors performed a Kaplan-Meier at two years follow-up. And they observed, as you can see, that severe 
uh, PPM start to become uh, to increase uh, the, the occurrence of severe PPM uh, start to uh, increase the risk of all cause mortality in this patient. Um, the same was not observed when in patient with moderate PPM. In the left side of the, uh, of the, um, the slide, you can also see the multivariate analysis in which you can see that the intraannular valve was observed, uh, was associated with uh, to an increased risk of PPM, uh, while post dilatation was associated with a reduced um, risk of PPM and more or less also the oversizing. Uh, it was also performed a uh, one year multivariate analysis and the, uh, the author observed that uh, um, as expected, as we all know, moderate or more than uh, or more uh, mitral regurgitation is associated with poor outcomes, but also the occurrence of severe PPM is associated to a uh, poor outcome at one year uh, follow up. Of course, this study has uh, a lot of um, Limitation, first of all, is a, a observational study. Few patients were reported at, at follow-up and uh, there are some missing, some missing data. However, in conclusion, we can say that intraannular valves are associated with an increased risk of uh, um, PPM, post-procedural PPM. Post dilatation and valve oversizing reduce the risk the occurrence of PPM, and severe PPM confers a risk and higher risk for one year or cause mortality. So, before starting the discussion, here there are uh, some of my questions to the author, to Damiano, also to Giannini. Um, uh, in your clinical practice, so you routinely go for post dilatation after implantation of a, of a valve in a patient to, um, with a small annuli. And uh, what about complications uh, such as uh, valve leaflet fracture in this patient? In case uh, we uh, in this in this paper in, in your paper you evaluate all just native stenotic uh, valve, but uh, uh, also valve in valve could be included in the group of uh, uh, small annuli, and um, therefore when you have a valve in valve, which is your um, pre-procedural planning to avoid PPM. And uh, um, what about the surgery? Do you, in, if you have a patient with a small annuli, would you prefer to go for surgery with the annular dilatation or TAVIR? And uh, if TAVI, which type of valve? Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Rosella. That was a really nice summary and overview, both of a topic which can be, I think, a little bit confusing sometimes to understand and, and also the paper. So, Damiano, if I can invite you to come in now, please. And, and share your thoughts and comments about this, this field, and in particular, some of these questions that Ross has raised. Yes, so good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for your invitation, Arif, um, Alessandro, Gise, Young, and everything, Maria Cecilia Hospital, Rossella, nice presentation. Um, I think that uh, uh, patient protest mismatch is something that we still uh, do not fully understand. First of all, uh, we have a problem of uh, measures uh, because obviously uh, in our paper, we took in account uh, the measured, uh, the measured uh, FC, uh, EOA uh, derived from ECHO uh, parameters. But anyway, we knew since uh, a couple of years that uh, there are uh, other ways uh, to measure patient protein mismatch and the EOA. Uh, like uh, CT derived uh, or uh, or manufacturer um, uh, tables for core valve and sapien that seems to be more accurate predicting uh, 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 at least a severe patient protein mismatch. So this is the first problem is to identify PPM. We really don't know uh, how to uh, correctly measure uh, patient protein mismatch. Anyway. Uh, if we uh, if we rely on our uh, on our uh, uh, methods, so uh, echo that is easy to use uh, is uh, is uh, something that every hospital can do. Uh, you can perform everywhere, and uh, it's more or less uh, reliable. Uh, we have to uh, to say that probably patient protein mismatch has uh, some type uh, of prognostic role. 
So, Rosella, you showed us uh, the results of the study, but uh, you, you also included uh, previous literature. Everyone, um, everyone uh, says, every, every paper that is published uh, said that uh, severe patient protest mismatch is a big deal. Uh, probably not in the first year. And I think that the problem is that in the first year, patient practice mismatch is uh, overcome by other uh, confounders like uh, paravalvular regurgitation, patient uh, permanent pacemaker implantation, and complication of uh, uh, pacemaker implantation, uh, and uh, vascular assesses complication uh, and the procedural related complication. So the first year, uh, is not the, 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 the perfect time frame uh, to evaluate patient protest mismatch, but uh, probably patient protest mismatch is a problem uh, after the first year, at least after the first year. And uh, we have not to forget that we are going to treat uh, patients that are going to be uh, younger and younger. So uh, we don't have to, to stop our follow-up at the first year. Anyway, you, uh, you ask about valve in valve procedure. In my opinion, valve and valve procedure are a completely different animal. I don't think that uh, uh, we, we decided to exclude uh, uh, valve and valve procedure from our analysis uh, because, uh, uh, in fact, the risk of patient protest mismatch in valve and valve procedure is super high. It's completely different. Uh, we, we estimated a risk of 5% uh, in general population, 40% in valve and valve procedure. So, is something that uh, is completely different. Plus, uh, for valve in valve procedure, you have uh, some type of uh, uh, tricks uh, like uh, uh, valve cracking or supranual valve implantation uh, that you can use uh, uh, to try to avoid uh, patient protest mismatch. Anyway, obviously, uh, the, 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 the risk of PPM in this population is super high because they already have uh, PPM at the baseline because... Uh, Almost all patients receiving biological, as you showed, biological surgical valve has uh, some degree of PPM. So I think uh, that valve in valve procedure must uh, be uh, taken outside of the analysis because obviously you cannot avoid some degree of PPM because the patient already has some degree of PPM. And uh, in this population, we don't have still a solution. Obviously, we know that uh, uh, transcatheter valve implantation is better than reduced surgery in terms of mortality, short-term mortality and medium-term mortality. But anyway, you end up risking uh, some type of PPM and you will have it. There is no, 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 no possibility to avoid, completely avoid PPM in this population. Talking about uh, uh, native uh, aortic valves without, uh, with small annulus, yeah, this is this is uh, the real problem because uh, uh, it all depends uh, what uh, what are your goals. You can try to have uh, the few uh, the fewer uh, paravalvular regurgitation as possible. You can try to have the larger area as possible. You can try to have uh, the valve with uh, um, the higher possibility of uh, uh, engagement of coronary coronary ostia because the patient has some type of coronary artery disease you can try to avoid patient uh, you can try to avoid the permanent pacemaker implantation you cannot uh, you you will not have all these four parameters all these four results in the same prosthesis for example balloon expandable valves we are we are studying the, the balloon expandable valve in in this new study that is the tavis small 2 and i wish i will tell you just a couple of things about it uh, balloon expandable uh, prosthesis will have low pacemaker implantation rate, low paravalvular regurgitation rate, easy access to the coronary ostia, but the higher gradient possible in our in our uh, in our uh, toolbox. So uh, you have to choose between uh, one of uh, these uh, risks. Probably patient protest mismatch, uh, taking in account these four parameters, so gradients regurgitation, pacemaker, and coronary access is probably the less prognostic, uh, at least. Probably is more prognostic than coronary access, but less prognostic than paravalvular regurgitation and patient in the permanent pacemaker implantation. But anyway, you have to choose uh, uh, according to uh, each and every patient. 
uh, you showed us that in fact patients with uh, with uh, high risk of patient brothers mismatch are usually female so fewer fewer coronary artery disease uh, or less coronary artery disease extension so if you have to choose between coronary assets so supravalvular supra valves and uh, and uh, gradients so intravalvular uh, valves probably in this type of of uh, of population uh, is uh, coronary reassess is something that you can you can uh, you can skip or you uh, you can uh, uh, under uh, you, you 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 will accept the risk of uh, having uh, trouble reassessing uh, uh, re uh, reassessing uh, coronary ostia because they don't have coronary artery disease usually so you have to to choose out of these four uh, outcomes you have to choose. Uh, the one that you are less interested in, probably in this population, coronary assets and the patient and the, and the permanent pacemaker. So, in my opinion, if 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 I have a patient, an old patient with a high risk of patient protein mismatch, I will go with uh, with the supranormal valve. I will post dilate it if the results are not uh, well enough. Not only in terms of paravalvular regurgitation, but also in terms of uh, of gradients and. Uh, I will try to oversize as much as possible without risking uh, uh, coronary obstruction because coronary obstruction is something that is this population uh, is rare, less than one percent of population. But anyway, it's something that you, you you don't you don't want to you don't want to underestimate because it's a potentially uh, fatal uh, complication. So. Uh, if they have a good uh, uh, valsalva sinuses, I will go with large over over uh, size, so more than fifteen percent one size. Post dilatation, supranormal valves. This is my my mantra for for uh, for a patient at high risk of patient protein mismatch. Obviously, you you will end up with higher risk of valve regurgitation because you're not using sapien, and uh, higher risk of pa uh, pa uh, permanent pacemaker. But uh, oversize is not related or is not uh, directly related to permanent pacemaker implantation and with a higher risk of difficult reassess uh, to coronary arteries. So let me say just uh, one last thing about the, the second study that we are going to publish uh, or we are, going, we are trying to publish on Jack uh, in the next few months. Uh, that is the Tavismol 2. We took in account also uh, sapien, sapien tree, and uh, we studied uh, more than 1,600 patients. And in fact, uh, even uh, if you add uh, the balloon expandable valves uh, into the equation, supraannular will end up uh, going better than intraannular. So portico and sapien a little bit uh, uh, worse than uh, accurate anchor valve, pro and uh, R. And uh, uh, balloon expandable is not uh, the solution because it's not uh, outperforming portico in this population. In this specific, specific setting, so small, small uh, aortic annulus. So probably in this setting, you have to go supraannular. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, great. That's excellent. I think maybe in a few months' time, then we'll have our journal club on the Tavi Small too. Uh, may, Ross, maybe you can present that as a, as a follow-up and we'll invite you back, Damiana. So any other questions from the audience or any comments that anybody would like to have? Now is a good time. Hey, uh, I'm Francesco. Many thanks Ciao, Fra. to all of you and Damiano for uh, Ciao, Fra. these great uh, comments. I agree with uh, all he already said about this topic. Just a couple of comments I would like to add in native um, uh, TAVR in patients at very high risk of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. Of course, we have to try to, as Damiano said, to prefer supranular valve, trying to do a very high implantation. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, so we can also reduce the rate of pacemakers. Sometimes we cannot because of the coronary hostia that are not so high, but uh, uh, is always a balance, as uh, Damiano said. For the valve in valve is a very big problem. Now I think we have to start thinking about uh, um, uh, surgical valve cracking that has to be part of the pre-procedural planning, because we know that we cannot do it with all the 
uh, surgical valves. And uh, uh, in the pre-procedural planning, we have to see if we can uh, um, uh, adapt this, uh, uh, this strategy. I mean, we know that uh, uh, in, a re in a patient at risk of patient prosthesis mismatch, uh, uh, we have to use uh, a non-compliant balloon that is one millimeter higher in diameter uh, uh, as compared to the surgical valve. For example, for a microflow 21, we know that we have to use uh, a non-compliant balloon 22 millimeter. So from the CT scan, uh, we have to know if uh, the anatomy is suitable for this uh, potential procedural step. So the LVOT has to uh, be large enough uh, uh, to accommodate the balloon and the sinotubular junction uh, and for the sinotubular junction is the same. So we already know if in a specific patient with a specific surgical valve and anatomy, we can uh, use this strategy. Eventually, sometimes in patients at very high risk of uh, um, uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, I mean patient with a 19 diameter of surgical valve uh, in patient female, uh, uh, in patient in which we already know that we are using the intranural valve because of the uh, coronary hostia, for example, we can uh, consider also the, the surgery if the risk is not so high. So it's always a balance. And what I want to stress is that uh, the, the valve cracking has to be part of the pre-procedural planning. So Francesco, I totally agree with you. And let me add uh, one thing. Uh, we are uh, with a lot of young operators uh, uh, and uh, we are still young, uh, Francesco, me and you, but anyway, not so young like uh, the others. But anyway, uh, the only the, the things that you have to know is TAVR is the easiest procedure in interventional cardiology. It's really a shitty procedure. You, everyone can do it. So if you start doing TAVR and the complex coronary artery disease uh, treatment, uh, the easiest part is... Uh, is uh, it's becoming a completely, completely, uh, completely uh, a good operator with uh, with EVR. It's easy. It's really easy. The thing that uh, uh, that uh, uh, define a good operator, a good TAVR operator, or a bad TAVR operator is the planning. Everything that Francesco said is the key because we have to 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 plan the procedure. Doing the procedure, it's easy. Uh, except for uh, really, really uh, difficult assesses uh, or a really horizontal aorta or everything, but then, uh, it, they are uh, isolated cases. So it's not a technical issue. It's something that you have to plan your in your mind. Small annulus, small bioprosthesis, you have to be ready to go. Sopranal, high implantation, post dilatation, valve cracking. Uh, uh, the planning is everything. So if you have uh, uh, a one on one procedure, so uh, 700, uh, 700 uh, square millimeter without calcification with large assesses. You can choose whatever you can choose whatever you want. You can choose sapient tree. You can choose portico. You can choose accurate. You can choose core valve. You can go whatever. It's 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 uh, it's uh, a, a really an easy procedure. But uh, for every patient, you have to plan your procedure because planning is really the the thing that defines a good TAVR operator versus a bad or a mean. TAVR operator and for surgical valve um, failure, more it's, it's, it's even more important. I, I totally agree with Francesco. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for those comments. I have one question for the operators because I saw from your paper, Damiano, that the echoes were done pre discharge from hospital, correct? Yes. Now, if, if despite all the planning, you find out, let's say you do a procedure. And then you find out before discharge that this patient in front of me has severe PPM. And for whatever reason, let's say post dilation wasn't performed because you were a bit worried about bundle branch block developing something, some, some decision procedurally. How often have you then, or is this even considered at all a strategy to take the patient back as a stage procedure to try to optimize the valve or the valve hemodynamics before maybe a little bit more aggressive post dilation? Is this something that's ever considered or? Once you leave with PPM, unless you get a bit more room with self-expansion, that's it. Or you can do something afterwards. So it, it, it really a nice question, Arif, because uh, um, in our experience, not uh, Humanitas, but uh, all the centers, uh, 
no patient uh, was uh, carried in the cat lab uh, for a second procedure for post dilatation. But uh, the threshold for post dilatation during the procedure was uh, more or less for everyone 20 millimeter of uh, mean gradient. So no one left a patient with uh, more than 20 millimeter of mean gradient. Because it's an historic uh, uh, definition of patient protein mismatch, it's really clinical because uh, a patient that came out from the, cat, from the cat lab with more than 20 millimeter is something that you cannot accept. But uh, bis below 20 millimeter uh, of mercury, of mean gradient, everyone accepted it, even if uh, the risk of PPM was uh, high and in fact the PPM was there. And no one was carried back for post dilatation during uh, during uh, uh, the acute, mid term, or long or longer term follow up. So probably uh, uh, the answer is uh, that you have to achieve the best result during the index procedure because uh, no one uh, will uh, uh, go for uh, further optimization after the procedure itself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's say two minutes left. Any, any last questions or any last comments from anybody? So Arif, if I may add just a, a, a last info that is not pre present in the paper uh, and Francesco uh, knew it, um, oversizing is not related with higher risk of permanent pacemaker implantation. So um, uh, we were afraid of it and uh, we tried to evaluate uh, all the outcomes uh, in order to understand uh, if uh, you pay a price for oversizing. And we, in fact, we did not find any uh, additional uh, price that you have to pay for oversizing. So. If you do oversizing, you won't uh, be uh, 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 disappointed. Usually, you won't be uh, disappointed for, for self-expanding valve. Obviously, if you if you do balloon expandable and you oversize, you will end up with uh, with the cardiac rupture. But anyway, for self-expandable valve, you can uh, uh, you can safely oversize a little bit. And what extent of oversizing? Fifteen percent. It's not a thing that you can uh, really, really uh, do percentage. It's one size. If you are oh, in see, doubt okay, yeah, between yeah. 23 and 26 yeah. for valve, place the 26, it's okay. If you're in doubt with 23 and 25 portico, place the 25, it's better. If you're in doubt between <laughs> a small and medium accurate, place the medium that is better. So... Uh, if okay. if you if you if you if you can choose, obviously, if you are in the middle of twenty three, you cannot use twenty six. But anyway, if you are borderline twenty three or twenty six, I use the twenty six. That is always better. Yeah, just something to add. I agree once again with uh, with Damiano. This is because we worked for many years uh, together. Uh, if you uh, oversize with a self-expandable valve, what is crucial is to do a very high implantation. Otherwise, the risk is, uh, you know, if you do a standard implantation, especially in valve in valve, uh, just because your uh, TAVR is larger, uh, you do not have uh, a standard movement of the leaflet. So what you risk uh, is the higher gradient. Uh, because uh, the, the leaflets do not open properly, and, but you also risk the um, aortic regurgitation, intraprocedural, intra um, uh, prosthetic regurgitation, uh, just because you don't have uh, uh, a right closing of the leaflet. So it's fine. You can think about uh, the oversizing sometimes in patients at very high risk, but uh, uh, just if you are able, uh, uh, if you can. Uh, reach uh, an eye implantation. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Okay, so it's time now. So I just want to say again, thank you very much, Rosella, for the presentation uh, and for putting this together. Damiano, thank you for joining us despite your holidays and everything else with the kids. We really appreciated your insight and Francesco, both of you as the, as the authors on this paper. It was a, a really nice discussion. Uh,